I think. When I think of all you've done and all the battles you brought me home, hallelujah. You've been doing it for a long time. How he never, how he never let you Now I want to him who was able to keep me. Now I want to him who was able to keep me. Now I want to him who was able to keep me. Now I want to him who was able to keep me. How he never, how he Praise the Lord, everyone. Can we stand? Can we just lift our hands? Let's just begin to bless the name of Jesus. He's worthy in this place today. If you've come to worship the Lord, would you open your mouth? Would you clap your hands and give him praise? I've got a than a brother there is no judgment oh how he loves me I've got a friend and he is my strength he is my portion with me in the valley with me in the fire with me in the storm let
your soul and sing it with us. Hallelujah. Oh, praise my soul. God really loves us. God really loves us. Hallelujah. We are not today. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Amen. What an incredible presence of God in our service today. Man, welcome to POM. It's such a pleasure to have you here to each and every one of you and to especially our guests. Thank you for making the trip to POM today. Let's take a couple minutes here and just greet each other across the aisle. Shake someone's hand. If you're feeling really brave, give them a hug and tell them how good it is to see them. Once again, it is so, so good to see all of you in the house of the Lord today. Thank you for being at POM. We love that you, if this is your first time here, we hope you love it and you want to stay forever. Amen. You can return to your seat and be seated. Uh, we're going to go before the Lord in prayer before our ushers receive our offering today. We want to remember all of the names on the screen and uh, all of the needs that you have. If you have a need, would you just lift your hand? Amen. God knows, and we believe that God is able. So let's go before the Lord in prayer uh, for all of these needs. 
and then all of the names on the screen. So why don't you lift your voice with me? Jesus, we are here in your presence, God. We thank you that we can call on you in our time of need, our time of trouble. And God, you are a deliverer. You are a healer. You are a way maker. God, you give us peace that passes all understanding. So we come to you, Lord, as your church, God, knowing that you can do all things. Would you, would you move in these situations, God? Would you move for these needs and for these names, God? And we will be careful to give you all of the praise. In Jesus' name we pray. Bless this service, the remainder of this service, and this offering in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you, ushers. You can receive the offering. A couple of announcements before we move on into our service today. Immediately after church, there's going to be a bake sale outside supporting Mother's Memorial. Who wants to take home some baked goodies on your way out the door? Amen. Even if you don't need it, that's okay. You do need it. You need to buy it. And if you can't eat it, give it to someone who will. Um, out there, you'll also see some jars with some names on them, and that will be for the ladies who are walking in our 5K this weekend uh, for Mother's Memorial. So drop some, drop some stuff, <laughs> preferably dollar bills. I almost said coins, but maybe some dollar bills in those jars and support those ladies who are going to be walking on Saturday for our Mother's Memorial 5K. If you want more information about that and our upcoming ladies conference at the campgrounds, you can see the church center app for more details. There's also a ladies tea happening on Saturday, May 4th at 12 o'clock. This is for ages 16 and up. Lunch will be catered by Chicken Salad Chick. Any Chicken Salad Chick fans in, in the house? They have good cookies. Um, and our guest speaker is Sister Arlie Morell, Morell uh, from uh, um, Higher Praise Tabernacle in Covington. Lunch tickets are $12, and the deadline to get those is April 28th, next Sunday. So make sure you get those ladies. And if you have any questions, there's a sign-up sheet in the floor. You can also talk to the hostess. Also, I can't believe, well, I, I'm excited as a teacher. I know all of our school staff and teachers are exciting. As we approach the end of the school year, kids, are you excited about summer that's soon approaching? Well, one of the things we're excited about happening in a few weeks is our graduation Sunday, and we have several graduates that we want to honor on that day. So if you have a graduate in your family or you are graduating high school or college, uh, check out the form on, on the Church Center app, and you can be part of that recognition and that service, and we would love for you to, to celebrate that accomplishment for you. Also happening in summer is our VBS, and Sister Courtney Moore is coming to give you some more information about VBS. Give it up, kids. Are you excited about VBS? Praise the Lord, everybody. It's so good to see you today. Um, I'm here to tell you about an exciting event that we have coming up, and that is Vacation Bible School. Do I have any kids excited about VBS? <laughs> Grown-ups excited about dropping off your kids, going grocery shopping by yourself? Yes. Um, we are so excited. Our POM Kids team has already been working and preparing and planning so hard and getting everything ready for VBS this year. It is June 3rd through the 5th, and registration is free. VBS is this year for students all ages 2 to 12. We have added in a toddler class this year, so any students ages 2 to 12 are welcome to join us for VBS. While registration is free, you can order a VBS t-shirt um, on our registration when, when you register, you can also order a T-shirt. It's not required, but if you would like a T-shirt, we do have to have that order in by May the 5th. So while registration is free, you can order a T-shirt as long as that is in by May the 5th. That's when you can guarantee that. So you can register for VBS on the Church Center app or on our website, thepom.church. And we are so excited about VBS, and we cannot wait for you to join us on our jungle journey. Amen. Our choir is going to sing and lead us in some worship before we dismiss our kids and pastor comes to preach. So would you stand and just let's enter into another time of worship.
Let's love the Lord. I magnify you, Jesus. I worship your holy name. You are great and greatly to be praised. There's nobody like you, Lord. There's nobody like you, Lord. Somebody love him right now. Come on, just love him. It's you and him right now. I love you, Jesus. I magnify your matchless mighty name. You keep your promises. I doubt you now. I'm standing on your word. I'm standing on your promises. For your word is yes and it is amen. today. The presence of God is here. Thank you, Lord. Thank you to all of our guests for being here, but I'm so thankful the Lord Jesus Christ is in this house. This building didn't bring him. You brought him. Amen. You're the church of God on location. You brought him in this place. Thank you, Lord, for your presence in this house. Thank you, Lord, for your presence. Praise God. Anybody just feel that sweet presence of the Lord that's here? You feel that? Thank you, Jesus. Why don't you turn and tell somebody beside you, there's just nobody like Jesus. Would you just verbalize that to somebody? Tell them, there's just nobody like Jesus. 
There's just nobody like Jesus. There's just nobody like Jesus. Before you're seated, before I dismiss POM Kids, I just I want to say, uh, say a couple of things. Number one, over the next few weeks, we'll be sharing with you some updates concerning our check-in and check-out process for POM Kids that will not all, only be a blessing and a benefit to us now, but will prepare us as a church body for the future and whatever God has for our local assembly. And we're working hand-in-hand -hand with our security team that's led by Brother Brandon Harvey and identifying any weak points of security on our campus and making sure that gets addressed because the safety and security of our children and your families is a top priority and I know we all appreciate that. Amen? Amen. So we'll be talking more about that over just the next few weeks. And before we dismiss Pum Kids, Sister Courtney Morris, come here if you would, please. We want to take a moment to honor Sister Courtney for 15 years of children's ministry, loving children, teaching children, leading children, and it's her birthday today, so we honor you, we honor you today, 15 years. We thank God for Sister Courtney and the eternal impact that she's made in children's ministry in 15 years is worthy of honor. We thank God for that. P.O.M. Kids, you can be dismissed in Jesus' name. God bless you today. Amen. God bless our children and our teachers in Jesus' name. Praise God. Sweet presence of the Lord. Sweet presence of the Lord. Amen. Let's just pray and ask the Lord to speak to us. Would you, Lord? I thank you for your mercy and your grace. Thank you for your presence we feel. I ask you, Lord, that you'd speak to our hearts today and let your word fall on fertile soil. Let something that is said, God, let it take residence in our heart and our life. There's nothing like your word, and we give you praise and glory and honor. Thank you for being here, God. But I don't want to just be a hearer. I want to be a doer of your word. I want to receive it with gladness, the engrafted word of God that is able to save my soul. Bless your people today in the name of Jesus. And everybody said amen. amen. God bless you. You may be seated in Jesus' name. Amen. I'm just, just going to just talk to you today. And uh, uh, Revelation chapter 19, I'm going to read just a few different scriptures so you can remain seated that we're going to Revelation chapter 19, 9 through 10, and then we're going to go to John 10 and 10. Amen. Thank you, Brother Aaron. Revelation 19, 9 through 10, and he said unto me, Write, blessed are they which are called unto the marriage supper of the Lamb. And he said unto me, These are the true sayings of God. And I fell at his feet to worship him. And he said unto me, See thou do it not. This was an angel that went to visit John. He said, don't, don't, don't do that. Get up. I, I'm your fellow servant and of thy brethren that have the testimony of Jesus. Worship God for the testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. I want to just point out because I want to circle back to it at the very end. He said, get up, get up, John. As an angel visited John on Patmos, said, get up, get up, John. Don't worship me because I'm, 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 I'm of their, yeah, thy brethren. I'm your brother. John 10 and 10 said, the thief does not come except to steal and to kill and to destroy. I have come that they may have life and that they may have it more abundantly. The thief comes and he's going to steal, he's going to kill, he's going to destroy. But I have come that they may have life and that they may have it more abundantly. Brothers and sisters, we better be very thankful that the God we serve today is a restorer. He is a restorer. And, uh, and so I want to preach to you today about restoration because the God we serve is a restorer. The enemy comes to steal, kill, and destroy. Some translations say kidnap, kill, and then mutilate. The enemy of your soul is going to do everything he can to destroy you. It was not by chance that the false prophets of Baal would cut themselves. 
When they took Samson, they did not just chain him up. They plucked his eyes out. The Bible says that the demoniac of Gadara would cut himself. So the enemy is out to steal, kill, and destroy. But I want you to look at a very powerful passage of Scripture in Amos 3 and 12. Thus says the Lord, as the shepherd takes from the mouth of a lion two legs or a piece of an ear, so shall the children of Israel be taken out who dwell in Samaria. The rhyme says that all the king's horses and all the king's men couldn't put Humpty Dumpty back together again. But we're not talking about just any king today, brothers and sisters, because according to that verse right there, the Lord that we serve has the ability. If all you've got left is a leg or the piece of an ear, he can put your life back together because the God we serve is a restorer. He is a forgiver. And that's why we, as brothers and sisters of the household of faith, we better forgive and we better restore. The Bible says, you which are spiritual, restore those that are messed up. Restore those that make a mistake. Restore those that act like a jerk. And maybe you did a thousand things wrong, but if you'll just do one thing right, it can change your life forever. Amen. Because the God we serve is a restorer. So you need to stop holding things over people's heads. And stop bringing up things that happened six years ago. Or six weeks ago. Or six days ago. Put it under the blood. Stop talking about it and let's move on. Because there's plenty of self-righteous people walking around that's giving judgment and withholding mercy. But you do not want to live your life like that. You want to withhold judgment and you want to give mercy. Because the Bible says that with whatever measure you use, the same measure is going to be used against you. And there's too many people with just a thimble full of mercy, but they've got buckets full of judgment. But today in Jesus' name, you need to switch that around and you need to start carrying buckets of mercy because that's the measure that's going to be given to you when you need mercy and I'm just going to go ahead and tell you today you need mercy today and we need mercy tomorrow and we're going to need mercy next week so I'm going to give mercy because I need mercy amen So that's why I'm going to make up in my mind. It don't matter what's in your past. It don't matter what mistakes or terrible judgment calls you may have made in the past. When you decide to truly serve Jesus Christ, when you give your life fully to Jesus Christ, it changes everything. Because there may be only a few pieces left to work with, but Jesus Christ knows how to put your life back together again. You study the first message of Jesus in Luke chapter 4. He's 30 years old, and he's been publicly baptized by John the Baptist. And as his custom was, it said he went to church, and there was delivered unto him the book of the prophet Isaiah. And he started to read Isaiah 61, and this is found in Luke 4, 18 through 19. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to preach the gospel of the poor. He has sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives and recovery of sight to the blind, to set at liberty those who are oppressed. And interestingly enough, none of that was for Jesus. He was saying, I'm going to do this for somebody else. It's not for me. And then he gets towards the end of that in verse 19 and says to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord. And then he stops and he gives the scroll back to the rabbi and he says today this scripture is fulfilled in your ears. And I've taught this before but we'll teach it today. It it don't make sense really when you read that unless you study Isaiah 61 and Leviticus 25 because Leviticus 25 talks 
about something called the Jubilee. And the Jubilee was every 50th year. And it was so amazing because Israel is an agricultural land and they were farmers. And, and when the land was parceled out in the book of Joshua, the Lord knew that, you know, every once in a while, somebody's going to do something really dumb and they're probably going to lose the family farm. But the truth is, you never truly lost it totally because at least once in your life, and some people might see it twice, but at least once in your life, you would experience something called the year of Jubilee. And it was an entire year of restoration, which meant that every day of the year, somebody was getting something back that they thought was gone. So it was jubilee. It was just an entire year of worship and gratitude and favor. And it's also apparent that the first year of the ministry of Jesus was a jubilee year in the land of Israel because Jesus stuns everybody in the room when he says, you're never going to have to wait 50 years again because I am your jubilee. I am your restorer. Amen. Anybody in this house that God has ever restored something to, whether it be peace or salvation or joy, but you know, it didn't take years. It took moments. It took days. How? Because the God we serve is a restorer. He is our jubilee. Thank God I ain't got to wait 50 years anymore. I can be restored today. Today. And when you study the book of Exodus, Exodus has 40 chapters. But it really can be divided into three large segments. 1 through 19 of Exodus is the deliverance. 20 through 24 of Exodus are the rules or the disciplines. The commandments. But then starting in 25 through 40, all these chapters are dedicated to the tabernacle life of Moses. So there's a concept here that, that it's, it's first, it's deliverance. And then there's discipline. And then there's church life. So it's deliverance, it's discipline, and it's devotion. And it's still God's pattern today. But we got to be very careful. And I'm on pastor today. We got to be very careful that we don't get these things confused. Because some people can be really quick on the trigger. And you want to make sure that they learn all the rules. But you got to learn to stand before you can walk. So the first thing that's got to happen is deliverance. Everybody say deliverance. It's an exit. It's a jubilee. You're starting to get some faith and you're starting to see you can get some things back that you never thought you was going to see again. Love and peace and joy in the Holy Ghost. And then, yes, there are disciplines involved in this thing. And then a big part of it is church life, getting involved, working in the kingdom of God. And so it's very obvious that when he begins his ministry, he begins it with this whole concept of restoration. It's like when you read Exodus 22. If you stole somebody's ox, the ox in that day would be like your John Deere tractor. If you stole their ox, that's a pretty big deal. You can't just give one ox back. you got to give five ox back. If you stole their sheep, you couldn't give one sheep back. You had to give four sheep back. So David's pastor Nathan confronts him about the rich man who went across the fence and stole his neighbor's one sheep. And David said, I will make him pay back four times. And if you study the life of David, he paid back four specific times because he stole his friend's sheep. It says if you stole money, you got to give twice as much money back. But understand the difference in the Old Testament that it was, is that it was the thief that was doing the restoring. But in the New Testament, it's the one that was stolen from that's going to be doing the restoring. And so there's this beautiful, powerful scripture in Joel 2 and 25 that says, And I will restore to you the years that the locust has eaten the canker worm, the caterpillar, and the palmer worm. I will restore to you the years that the locust, the canker worm, the caterpillar, the palmer worm. And really, what this is, is the four stages of the metamorphosis of the locust. And that's very important for you to know today because one of them eats bark 
and then one of them eats fruit, and then one of them eats leaves, and then one of them eats buds. So when this thing had gone through the entire life cycle, it had basically stripped the tree down to nothing. You got no bark, you got no buds, you got no fruit, you got no leaves, but none of them were root eaters. And that leads me to another wonderful scripture in Job 14, 7 and 9 that says, For there is hope for a tree, if it is cut down, that it will sprout again, and that its tender shoots or branches will not cease, though its root grows old in the earth, and its stump may die in the ground, yet at the scent of water, It will bud again, and it will bring forth branches like a plant. You hear me today, my brothers and sisters. It may look hopeless. It may seem dead, but I've come to preach to you. It's time for you to smell the water. I smell the scent of water in this house today. It might look hopeless. It might look dead, and the leaves might be gone. The branches might be withered. There might not be no bark, but there's some roots down there, and just at the scent of water, though a tree has been cut down there is hope hey if I can just get to the water if I can just get to the water that a tree can live again and that's why Jesus told us in John 7 37 if any man thirst let him come unto me and drink for there is hope for a tree that even if it's been cut down even if there's been mistakes and failures and disappointments in the past yet at the scent of water it can burn again (laughs) oh thank you Jesus thank you Jesus Thank you, Jesus. It's so interesting to note that the prophecy I read to you from Joel, it doesn't say I'm going to give you back your orchards. I'm going to give you back your trees. I'm going, it says I'm going to give you back the years. And here's what I want you to understand. This is a prophecy about the church because you have this amazing church in the book of Acts. Peter said we were eyewitnesses of his majesty. Now, if you go to court and you're an eyewitness, that's a very big deal. Uh, It's not circumstantial. No, I saw it. And Peter said, I saw him raise the dead. I saw him heal. I saw him walk on water. But he said eventually... We, us disciples, we're going to die. And even Paul said, there's going to be people that's going to come after us and they're going to teach the commandments of men like they were the doctrines of God. And that's exactly what happened. What happened was the bugs got into the church and started eating stuff up. So I want you to slow your mind right now to a thinker's pace and let me teach you. Because the bugs got in and started eating things up. So a few years go by and now they're baptizing babies. And you don't want the babies to drown so let's not immerse them, let's sprinkle them. And so the first thing, baptism by immersion, it gets chewed up. And then the mighty God in Christ, it gets chewed up. And then the infilling of the Spirit, now it's gone. Baptism in Jesus' name, it's gone. So when you get to what uh, is called the Dark Ages, the political church at that time became one of the greatest book-burning institutions in the history of the world. So you have this Catholic priest by the name of Luther. And he's up teaching in one of their seminaries one day. And he's teaching his students from the book of Romans. And he makes this connection and God gives him revelation. And he thinks, oh my, you are justified by faith. You're not justified by your bank account. And so Martin Luther took a stand against what was going on at that time. Because the church was in trouble and the church needed money. 
free. And so they manufactured something called purgatory. And it's not in the Bible, but it was a pretty smart move because uh, they started saying, you know, everybody goes to this halfway house called purgatory after you die. But if you'll give this priest, this man, some money, he'll do a mass for you. And, and, and he will get your dead boy into heaven. And if you're just some poor fella that don't know any better, you're going to empty your entire life savings to make sure your boy or your girl gets to heaven. But it was not true. So in 1517, then Martin Luther says, you're justified by faith. And he was absolutely right. So he creates a church called the Lutherans. And then about 50 years later, a guy by the name of John Calvin comes along. And he says, you know, y'all got popes and y'all got cardinals, but but there's 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 no presbyters. Why why aren't you why don't you have any presbyters? Because popes and cardinals aren't in the Bible, but presbyters are. And the Catholic Church calls John Calvin a heathen. And so John Calvin, he sets off and starts what's called the Presbyterian Church. And then you get to John Smith in 1609 and he comes along and he looks at the church and he says, you know, baptizing babies is really crazy. And why in the world are you guys not baptizing by immersion? So in the early 1600s, the Baptist Church shows up. And then John and Charles Wesley, they show up in 1730 and they say, you know what you really need is we got to have a method. We got to put everything down, A, B, C, D. So you get saved and sanctified, filled with the Spirit, that type of thing. And so they create the Methodist church. And then you have this outpouring of the Spirit that happens around the turn of the century. And then you start seeing divine healing happening again. And so there's this church in the book of Acts. And then there's this church in the dark ages and it doesn't hardly resemble it at all. Why? Because the bugs have chewed it apart. But the prophecy was, I'm going to restore the years that the bugs ate. And so what happened was we incrementally got back to the book of Acts. Justification by faith. Pastors and presbyters. We got water baptism by immersion. We got the infilling of the Holy Ghost. We got divine healing. But here's the problem. If we're not careful, Pentecost can be just as guilty as everybody else because we can build a fence around Acts 2.38 and say, we got the truth. But you got to understand this. The truth is not a doctrinal position. The truth is a person. Amen. Jesus said, I am the way, I am the truth, and I am the life. And if we're not careful, we can be guilty of loving our doctrine but losing our love affair with our Savior. And you better love this message. One Lord, one faith. One baptism, one God and Father of all, who is above all and through all and in you all. You must be born again of the water of the sin of the Spirit, having a personal death and repentance, burial and baptism, resurrection with the infilling of the Holy Ghost, giving us power to overcome sin and walk in righteousness and on the highway of holiness. I love this message. I love this truth. I love this word. But the word became flesh. The word became flesh. Because truth, my brothers and sisters, is a person. Truth is a person. See, there's a lady. There's a lady that uh, followed the apostles in Acts 16. Acts 16, 17 through 18. Look at this. This girl followed Paul and us and cried out saying, These men are servants of the Most High God who proclaim to us the way of salvation. That sounds like truth to me. These men are the servants of the Most High God who proclaim to us the way of salvation. And this she did for many days. But Paul, greatly annoyed, turned and said to the Spirit, I command you in the name of Jesus Christ to come out of her and came out that very hour. What she was saying was true. But Paul turned around and cast the devil out of her. Why? Because she was doctrinally correct, but her spirit was wrong. You got to worship him in spirit and truth. You got to have both. And I know there may be some disagree with me, and that's fine. But I'd rather work with people who have bad doctrine, but right spirits, than I would with people that have right doctrine, but they got a bad, nasty attitude. That's my opinion. 
You give me the person with the right spirit and the bad doctrine and we can find some common ground and we can get somewhere. Because spirit is the right attitude. Truth is the right information. You got to have them both. Amen. The Bible said as many as are led by the spirit of God, they are the sons of God. We don't just get to put our spiritual car in neutral and say, you know, I like it right here. This is perfect. I'm just going to cruise right here until I get to heaven. No, no, no. If you study Israel, this is crazy. But you can prove they had water at the Red Sea. They had water at the Jordan. They came across the Red Sea and they go three days journey and they're thirsty. So Moses hits a rock and water comes out of the rock. And this is what it says in 1 Corinthians 10 and 4. And all drank the same spiritual drink, for they drank of the spiritual rock that what? Followed them, and that rock was Christ. They say that water always takes the path of least resistance. But but Corinthians 10 said they had a river that followed them. And then you've got this cloud that gives you shade by day, and it gives you heat by night, and it's beautiful. But they set up 42 camps in 40 years. Uh, Think about how much inconvenience that was. 42 camps in 40 years, which is probably about every 11 months. They're moving. Because if you study the first chapter of the book of Numbers, it numbers all the men, 20 to 50, who were capable of going to war. And it says the number was 603,550. We don't know how many there were under 20. We don't know how many there were over 50 by way of men. We have no idea how many women there were. And the tribe of Levi is not even numbered. So you're very easily talking about 2 million people here. You're talking about the size of Houston, Texas. This is a big deal. And so all those people had to learn to be led by the Lord. And don't you know that some of those campsites were so much better and nicer than others. And just when they're getting settled in and the mailman's finally learned their new address and mama said, man, this is such a nice spot right here, honey. Then the pastor comes up and says, all right, we got to go. It's time to leave your comfort zone. We got to go. But one mama says, no, 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 I'm not going. Okay, well, if mama's not happy, we'll stay. But here's the problem. That night, the kids say, Daddy, it sure is cold. Daddy, I'm cold. There's no pillar of fire for warmth. And then the next morning, they get up, and Daddy, I'm I'm hungry, Daddy, but there's no manna. Daddy, I'm thirsty, but there's no riverbed because they're dry. Why? Because I've taught you the presence of God contains the provisions of God. If you want the provisions of God, you've got to stay under the cloud. You've got to stay in the presence of God. His provision is found in his presence. You stay under the cloud, you get the stuff. Amen. But he's not going to let you get comfortable in one place too long. He's always calling you higher. He's always calling you higher. He's not going to let you get comfortable too long. He's always moving. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth, and the Spirit of God moved. There's two things I can tell you about God. He'll never be surprised, and he's always moving somewhere. And what does that mean? That means we got to move also. When the Spirit moves, we got to move. If you want to be a child of God, you have to be led by the Spirit. You can't just say, oh, I like it where I'm at because after a while, all you're going to see is smoke and taillights because the church is going on. Amen. That's why I can't afford the luxury of staying in comfort zones because everything that God builds grows. For instance, the tabernacle of Moses. I want to show you this. This is just a tabernacle pattern. This is a tabernacle for us today. If you look at the tabernacle of Moses, it's got a holy of holies, 10 cubits by 10 cubits by 10 cubits. But then 1 Kings 6 tells us the holy of holies in Solomon's temple is 20 cubits by 20 cubits by 20 cubits. So twice the size. That's why you get this verse, Haggai 2 and 9. The glory of this latter house shall be greater than the former, saith the Lord of hosts. And that's not only the reality with the tabernacle. It's a prophecy to the church. Because Acts 2, that's our ancestors. That's the former church. But the glory of the church today is going to exceed the church in the book of Acts. 
And if you don't believe that, I can, I can tell you about a picture that I personally saw at Brother Arnold's church in Florida where Brother Kleinitz and Billy Cole preached to 600,000 people in a church in Ethiopia and over 100,000 of them got the Holy Ghost in one day. One day. And you may say, well, oh, well, you know, how do you know they had that many? Let me tell you why. Because they have what they call the book of life in Ethiopia. And when you get the Holy Ghost in Ethiopia, they want to know what your name is. They want to know what your parents' names are. And they want to know your grandparents' names. So they're not just flying by the seat of their pants. And in that one service, of the outpouring of the Holy Ghost was bigger than anything we see in the Bible. Because the glory of the latter is going to be greater than the former. Brothers and sisters, you, and I know sometimes it's kind of hard for us, but we got, I'm trying to stretch us today. I'm trying to stretch and say God wants to do some things in us and through us that we ain't even heard about in the Bible and that it sees anything you've read about in the Bible. Hey, I'm doing something that none of the uh, disciples ever did. I'm preaching in Georgia today. None of the disciples ever preached in Georgia. Amen. Hallelujah. I'm going to tell you, God wants to use you in ways and in areas that nobody else was used because the greater, the glory of the latter is going to be greater than the former. And he wants to do it through us. Amen. And God is challenging us. I feel a challenge in my spirit from the Lord to move today. Amen. To stir up that gift that has been placed in you. Because the glory of the latter house is going to be greater than the former. And it's up to you. It is absolutely up to you. You're going to have to choose. Because this is about hunger. This is about desire. This is about the lost. This is about seeing God do something in you. But it doesn't stop there. He also wants to do something through you. For people that you don't even have names for and for people that you don't even have a face for yet that's what God wants to do amen amen look at Hebrews 7 1 through 2 for this Melchizedek king of Salem priest of the most high God who met Abraham returning from the slaughter of the kings and blessed him to whom also gave a tenth part to all to whom all Abraham also gave a tenth part of all. Verse 4. Now consider how great this man was, to whom even the patriarch Abraham gave a tenth of the spoils. He paid his tithes. And indeed, those who are of the sons of Levi, who received the priesthood, have a commandment to receive tithes from the people according to the law, that is, from their brethren, though they have come from the loins of Abraham. But he whose genealogy is not derived from them received tithes of Abraham and blessed him who had the promises. Verse 7, now beyond all contradiction, the lesser is blessed by the better. Here mortal men receive tithes, but there he receives them of whom it is witness that he lives. Even Levi, verse 9, who receives tithes, paid tithes through Abraham, so to speak, for he was still in the loins of his father when Melchizedek met him. Even Levi, who receives tithes, paid tithes through Abraham, so to speak, for he was still in the loins of his father when Melchizedek met him. Now look at Exodus 20, and I'm going to come back to that. Exodus 20 and 5. You shall not bow down to them nor serve them, for I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God, visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children to the third and fourth generations of those who hate me, but showing mercy to thousands, to those who love me and keep my commandments. Abraham is first. Isaac is second. Jacob is third. Leave a, first. Abraham is first, Isaac second, Jacob is third, Levi is fourth. It's third generation though. Levi is third generation. So Levi is the great grandson. My son's Isaac. My grandson Jacob. My great grandson Levi. Levi is the great grandson of Abraham. And according to Hebrews 7, when Abraham paid tithe to Melchizedek and gave 10% to that priest, he literally put credit on the account of his unborn grandson. And when Levi got ready to pay tithes for the first time, it wasn't really his first time. He already had credit on the books because of what his grandfather had done. So I want you to hear me. You and I have the ability to affect our children and our grandchildren, and they may not even be born yet. This is not just about us. 
I'm trying to push some stuff through you. It is not just about you. It's about others. It's about your family. It's about people you do know. And it's about people you don't know. For the promise is unto you and to your children and to those that are afar off. It's not just about us. I am not living how I live and doing what I do just for me. It's for others. That's what ministry is all about. Jesus came. What he came to do was for others. He did not come to be served, but the Bible says he came to serve and to give his life a ransom for many and to restore his people back into relationship with him. Why? Because Jesus Christ is in the restoration business, which means that the POM better be in the restoration business. And the question is, do we want to be like Jesus or not? And if the answer is yes, then we better start serving others. We better serve the Lord with gladness, not out of drudgery, not out of, oh boy, I got to get there early again. I got to do this again. No, no, no. Don't you let the devil lie to you. This is a beautiful, holy thing, serving in the kingdom of God. Amen. I know it's a burden. I do. The work of God is just that. It is work. There's early mornings. There's late nights. There's a lot of things that's going out of your way. And not everybody appreciates you the way God appreciates you. And sometimes you run into people when they're having their worst day of the week. That's what happens sometimes when you're carrying the beautiful, precious, holy things of God. But don't you be discouraged in that. It might be a burden, but I've told you before, it's a beautiful burden. It might be a burden, but it's a holy burden. It's a wonderful, holy thing, and it's my high privilege. It's the high privilege of my life to serve Jesus Christ and to serve his body, the body of Christ. We are a part of the body of Christ. In this building, across these chairs, we're a part of the body of Christ. And this thing is going on with or without you. I really hope I can challenge us today to get your hands busy in kingdom work. And I don't just mean while you're at church. I mean kingdom work every day. I mean being the house of God on location. I mean being somebody's answer to their prayer. You can be the answer to somebody else's prayer. But you've got to realize, I've got to get my hands busy. I've got to be sensitive. God, put somebody in my path. God, speak to me. Let me be sensitive when you say, you know, we, we kind of forget sometimes the Bible does say sometimes we do entertain angels unaware. Amen. And even if they're not an angel, there's hurting people. This world is full of hurting people that just need a little kindness, a little love, and a little nudge in the right direction of, hey, I just want you to know I love you and I appreciate you. Anything I can do for you? Can I pray for you about anything? Or if they open up their hearts and they're telling you about their, their mother or whatever, something that's going on in their life, oh, well, okay, well, thanks for letting me know. No, 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 lean into that. Listen, I want you to know that I'm going to pray for you. I, and if with your permission, I'll put you on our prayer list at the church and email the church. We'll put you on our prayer list. I'm going to tell you, brothers and sisters, don't just... Kick that to the side. There are people that need somebody. God will open those doors, but you got to walk through them. You got to, and it's simple stuff, and we overcomplicate it, but it's very simple. It's very simple, but we got to be the house of God on location. And I hear people all the time say, I don't know how to witness. I don't know how to. Let, me, let me just give you a very simple, let me give you a very practical way to, to, be, to witness, okay? And this, don't, this, this applies wherever you live. You go back to work, you have a conversation with a friend, family, whatever. Hey, man. What y'all do this weekend? How was your weekend? Oh, it's great. Man, well, what'd you do? Well, they're going to tell you. Went to a birthday party, played ball, kids soccer, cookout, went to the lake, whatever. Now, there, you're two questions in. How was, your, how was your weekend and what'd you guys do? Two questions in. Chances are the third question is going to be, what would you say if I'd asked you those two things? You'd say, well, how was your weekend, right? And I'd say, well, I'm glad you had. <laughs> <laughs> But I'd say, oh, man, it was great. And I'm not jumping straight into trying to over-spiritualize it. Saturday, we, whatever. But then Sunday, we went to church, and I'm going to tell you the presence of God was so powerful and the peace of God was so strong, and God just transformed lives. Now, is that like uber-spiritual? I don't think so. 
I don't think so. But it's a way, and here's the thing. Oh, that's cool, man. And they might totally brush it off. That's fine. But here's two points to that, that they brush it off and they never run up again. Fine. Second thing is, oh, man, that's amazing. Somebody that needs to hear exactly what you just said. What? The peace of God, the church, transform it. What? What kind of church you go to? And just see what happens. And here's the third thing. They might brush it off, but God might deal on the backside of that with a dream later. You know, peace is what I need. Strength is what I need. I'm not, I'm not shoving anything down their throat. I'm just saying, hey, this is what I did on Saturday. And then on Sunday, I went to the house of God, and it was so powerful. The presence of God was so strong. That's so simple and easy and true. And who knows who needs to hear it. It's just letting people know, hey, there is a God that is alive and well and transforming lives. That's all we're doing is just letting somebody know. We're just letting them know, hey, hey, I serve a God that's real, and he can meet needs. You want, you want more information? I'm just putting that in your ballpark. You do what you want to with it. But brothers and sisters, we got to be the house of God on location. Amen. And if you don't know what that means, you go back and listen to the message last week. I broke it down. There's five points with Jacob when he saw ascending and descending. But we got to be the house of God on, on location. Amen. And that don't mean making a mockery and acting foolish and all that stuff. That just means being kind. Amen. And showing the love of God and the fruit of the Spirit. Amen. Because we're the body of Christ. But we've got to get out of our comfort zone. And we got to do a great work for God together. This is so much bigger than you and me. This church, this church is so much bigger than you and me. Because, you know, some guys can be so short-sighted. You know, it, like, if you don't go to our church, you can't be saved. That is so ignorant. It's like sitting in a bathtub and pouring a box of Morton salt in there and say, this is the Atlantic Ocean. It's dumb. Because this thing called the church is massive. And it's amazing. Amen. And you need to hear some stories about the church in Bangladesh or China or Korea or the Philippines and so many other countries and places. Listen, you got brothers and sisters on the other side of this planet. You can't even pronounce their names. But one day, we're going to have a great reunion and I'm going to be there. Don't you want to be there? Don't you want to go there? And don't you want to take somebody with you there? Well, then why don't you be the church? It's going to be amazing. What a reunion that's going to be. What a reunion that's going to be. You look at Samson. You look at Samson. Here's what fascinates me about Samson. The Bible don't talk about him having a bunch of muscles. It's possible that he didn't look like Schwarzenegger. Samson could have looked like me. But when the anointing hits him... Boom! But Samson, he's so ignorant. He's sitting in Delilah's barbershop. And he said, okay, the worst thing that could ever happen to me if I lose my covenant with God is I'll just be like everybody else. Hey, Samson, everybody else ain't blind. Everybody else didn't have their eyes plucked out. Everybody else ain't grinding at the meal, going around in circles all day. But then all of a sudden, his hair starts growing back, and he said, oh, God. If you could just touch me one more time. And the Bible says that he did more at the end than he did during his entire life. Restoration. Look at Job and all the oxen and cows and camels and stuff that he had. But then compare it to the end of Job in 42. God doubled everything that Job had. Hast thou considered my servant Job? What kind of relationship with God do we have to have for God to give a recommendation to the devil for you going through a trial? Hast thou considered my servant Job? But God put, he covered him and he gave him back twice what he had in the end because he's a God of restoration. And you can take this whole concept of restoration throughout the entire word of God, and it's absolutely fascinating. Consider the first murder in the Bible. One brother jealously killing another brother. So, in my opinion, it's not a mistake. It's first murder, two brothers, brothers, brothers. It's not a mistake that when Jesus began his ministry, he chose not one, but two sets of brothers. Andrew and Peter, James and John. They got names for these guys, the sons of thunder. 
It's probably talking about their zeal. And there's three powerful conversions in Acts 8 through 10. Acts 8, there's the Ethiopian eunuch, which is a massive conversion. In, in Acts 9, it's Saul, another major conversion. In Acts 10, it's Cornelius, and we better be very thankful for that because we're Gentiles like him. <laughs> Amen. He was a Gentile just like us. And these three guys are major, major players in the church. And in Acts 10, Peter takes six of his fellow disciples with him down to Cornelius' house. And the Bible says right while Peter is teaching, they get the Holy Ghost. And Peter says, can any man forbid water? Now, it's, I'm kind of reading between the lines, but I think he's kind of looking at his pal saying, you guys got any real reason, good reason why we shouldn't do this? Because if I baptize these Gentiles, I'm going to be in real trouble with the district board when we get back. And they can't come up with a good reason, and so they baptize them. And then in Acts 11, even though Peter's a big deal, he is submitted to these unnamed elders in the Jerusalem church. And they're raking him across the coals. Why'd you go down to that Gentile dog's house? And he said, hey, listen, listen, listen. These people received the same precious gift that we have received, who believed on the Lord Jesus Christ and they have purified their hearts through faith. And he was saying they repented, they heard the word, they received the Holy Ghost, and then I baptized them. See, listen, you can get the Holy Ghost without being baptized, but you will not get the Holy Ghost without repenting. The purified their heart by faith, the Bible says. They got the Holy Ghost, then they got baptized. So Peter's giving them a play-by-play -play in Acts chapter 11. And the church is absolutely exploding with growth. But just a little while longer, there's going to be some church problems because all these Gentiles are coming into this Jewish church and, 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 and some people are getting really upset about it because somebody's taking their parking spot and somebody's taking their seat and somebody don't look just like them. So now we come to Acts 12, 1 through 2. Now about that time, Herod the king stretched forth his hands to vex certain of the church. And he killed James, the brother of John, with the sword. Now there's four Herods in the Bible. You've got Herod Antipas, Herod the Great, Herod Agrippa I, Herod Agrippa II. And I'm going to tell you, these guys are just... They're ignorant. One of them, Antipas, is the guy that cut off John the Baptist's head. Another one kills all the male children under the age of two and presided over the, over the trial of Jesus himself. You got Herod Agrippa I, which is the guy in Acts 12 who kills John's brother James. And then you got Herod Agrippa II who had the power to release Paul, but he wanted Paul to bribe him, and Paul wouldn't do it. But the best you can get out of these four Guys, is one of them finally said, you almost persuaded me to be a Christian. These guys had access to John the Baptist, James, Paul, and Jesus, but none of them are in the church. And I learned the lesson over and over again. I can't make anybody live for God so I teach you, I love you, and I will reach for you until the Lord himself comes back. But I can't make you live for God. There's a man in the Bible called the demoniac of Gadara. But if you study the book of Matthew, the book of Matthew says there were two that met him out of the tombs. Not one, but two. Two guys hear the same gospel, the same message, the same Jesus. One gets delivered. One stays bound and lost in the tombs. And I see it in the church. People hear the very same music. They hear the very same message. They're sitting in the very same atmosphere. And somebody responds in faith and is blessed. But others can't wait to get out the back. What is the difference? It's Hebrews 4 and 2. For unto us was the gospel preached as well as unto them. But the word preached did not profit them, not being mixed with faith in them that heard it. Hear me. Do not ever miss an opportunity to mix the word of the Lord with faith in your spirit because it will always bless your life. 
That is why the altar call is so important. Because while I'm preaching, the Lord is speaking to you through his word. But the altar call is where you come and talk back to God. All throughout the word of God, nothing happened until he spoke. And nothing's going to happen in your life until you speak. Because the power of life and death is right there. It's right there. When James is killed in Acts chapter 12... It was, a, it was a blow to the church because this was one of the original 12, but more than that, it was one of the original three because it was always Peter, James, and John. And when James is killed, the verse I just read to you infers that Herod did it himself. He didn't delegate it. The Bible said he killed James, the brother of John, with the sword. I was thinking about it, and I was just trying to put myself in the shoes of John when he realized that the, under, the other half of the thunderclap was gone. My brother's dead. And so John's re, uh, writing the book of Revelation, and there's seven no mores there. Six of them, they make perfect sense. There will be no more death. There will be no more sorrow. There'll be no more crying. There'll be no more pain. There'll be no more curse. There'll be no more night there. But then in Revelation 21, he says, there'll be no more sea. All of the others make sense to me. We can all get that. But you have to realize that John is on an island called Patmos. It is the Alcatraz of his day. And you don't need dogs and you don't need guns. You can't leave because the currents of the Mediterranean Sea, you'd absolutely drown. But I just, uh, I got this feeling that when John is writing, he gets down to the edge of the water. As close as he can physically get to his brothers and sisters in Christ, which would be the church in Ephesus. And he looks out and says, one day there won't be any sea. There won't be anything separating me from my brothers and sisters in Christ. Brothers and sisters, we better be thankful for the house of God. The body of Christ. There's nothing like the body of Christ. All throughout the book of Revelation, there's all these encounters you can read about. And I'm not an expert on the book of Revelation. But all throughout the book of Revelation, John has encounters with beings, these angels, and it's, it's so amazing. But when you get towards the end of the book in, in Revelation 19, what I read to you at the beginning, he said unto me, write, blessed are they which are called to the marriage supper of the Lamb. And he said unto me, these are true sayings of God, and I fell at his feet to worship him. And the angel said, no, John, no. Get up. Don't worship me. Because I'm thy brethren. I'm of thy brethren. And I was just thinking when I read that the other day, I wonder if the angel that went to visit John was his brother James. And maybe it's just because I was in an emotional state at the moment, just thinking about loved ones that had passed. But I want to tell you this. If you have a loved one that served God... And has went on to be with the Lord and you want to see them again. Serve the Lord with gladness. Because there's going to be a great getting up morning. And we're going to have a reunion like you can't even imagine. And I was thinking about uh, this past Wednesday night was anniversary. Just a great lady in, that just blessed my life and blessed many of you. But uh, this past Wednesday night was anniversary of the last service. Sister Chris was in church, and what a tremendous woman of God she was. And her and my mom was just great friends, and they were just amazing ladies. 
And I just thought about that and how they just, both of them showed us how to go to heaven right. And so I just thought, you know, I want to do this thing right. Because it's how you finish that counts. Because I don't want to preach the gospel to you and then come out myself a castaway. And so I want to make sure I finish strong. I want to make sure I keep the main thing the main thing. Because there's people I want to be reunited with in heaven. And heaven's sweeter every day. And I want to see my Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. I want to be with him. And so I'm trying my best as your pastor just to provoke your mind and just try to nudge you to say, let's live for God. And, and, and let's serve God and let's serve other people. And let's worship God together. And let's weep with one another. And let's rejoice with one another. And let's encourage one another. And let's love one another. Amen. Let's do life together. Let's serve together. And let's go to heaven together. I got a made up mind. I'm going to heaven and I really want you to go with me. But if you decide you ain't going, I'm still going. I'm going. I'm going. <laughs> Stand with me. Stand with me. I got more to say, but I just, I feel the Holy Ghost right now. I want to make it to heaven. I want to serve the Lord. But I want to take as many people to heaven with me that I can. I'm not going to embarrass you today. I promise I won't embarrass you. But everybody, would you please come and stand in this altar with, with me? Would you do that? Would you just come and stand in this altar? All I want to do is pray for you. I won't embarrass you. I just want to pray for you. And I want to tell you something the Lord spoke to me on Tuesday. Just come to this altar just as close as you can. Oh, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus, for the body of Christ. Thank you, Jesus, for the privilege to serve you and serve other people. God, move through us to reach a lost and dying world, to love people that you died for. You're in the restoration business. I want to be in the restoration business. You're in the people business. I've got to be in the people business. Come on as close as you can so nobody's left in the aisles. Come on, come on. Church is the body of Christ. I was, uh, I was sitting right here on Tuesday. I came and spent some time with the church, and I had no direction. And I had to get it because I was leaving to go out of town, and uh, had no direction for today. And the Lord, I feel like the Lord spoke to me right here and said, "Remind my people that I am a restorer. Remind my people that I'm a restorer." And as soon, and this is not a song that I listen to a lot, but as soon as that came to my mind, the Lord put this song on my heart. Would you help me with that, Greg? Gabe? Here's what it says. It's not as dark as you believe. It's not as bad as it may seem. And if it feels like you can't breathe, there's still a voice that's whispering. What's it saying? Your story's not over. Because you're still breathing. What seems like an ending. The tree's been cut down. The, the bark's gone. The branches are gone. The leaves are gone. The buds are gone. What looks like an ending is just a beginning. Hope and a future coming alive. You're going to make it. You're going to make it. Have you lost some things? Have you lost some years? Here's what I want to tell you. I smell water. I smell water. I smell water in this house today because Jesus Christ is here to restore. And the whole time I've been preaching, the Lord has been speaking to you through his word. But now I, my challenge is, would you lift your voice and talk back to him and let him restore what has been lost? Would you open up your heart right now and open your mouth? Come on, God is here to restore right now. I can smell the scent of water. And if there's hope for a tree, there's hope for me. If there's hope for a tree... <laughs> There's hope for you. There's hope for you. There's hope for you. Come on. Come on. He's a God of restoration. 
Some of you feel like you've wasted so many years. I mean, I can't make a comeback. It's been so long since I've been where I need to be with God. It's been so long since I worship like I should worship. It's been so long since I had the prayer life I should have. But I'm telling you today, I smell the water. I smell the water. It's not over. It's not over. It's not over. It might look like an ending, but it's just the beginning. It's just the beginning. The bark might be gone. The limbs might be gone. The buds might be gone, but the root's still there. And at the scent of water, there is hope for a tree. There is hope for a tree that it will bud again. It will sprout again at the scent of water. If appropriate, I want you to link with somebody beside you, a man to man, lady to lady, husband to wife, ministry, help me right now. I want us to pray for one another as the body of Christ. As the body of Christ right now. God, I impart and speak. Uh, I speak restoration. That's the word I want you to pray. God, restore. God, restore. Speak that word over your brother. Speak that word over your sister. God, restore my brother. Restore my sister. Restore everything that's been taken away. Restore the years. Restore the joy. Restore the peace. Restoration. Restoration. Come on, speak that over somebody right now. I speak restoration. I speak restoration. I speak restoration, God. I speak restoration, Lord. I speak restoration, Lord. The Lord has spoke. And if you'll speak, you're going to see something happen. Open up your mouth and tell him. He knows what you have need of. He's just waiting on you to be honest. Open up your mouth and tell him, God, I need it. I need strength in my life. I need peace in my mind. Tell him what you need. Make your petitions known unto God. Come on. He's a God of restoration. And at the sin of water, at the sin of water, there's hope for a tree. There's hope for a tree. There's hope for a tree. Reach over and pray for somebody else right now.
Just still breathing, I'll see. 